Uh, John chapter 11. It's a great chapter. It really is. It's a great chapter. This is by far, uh, and, and without any doubt whatsoever, the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed. And how many of these did he do? How many people did Jesus raise from the dead? I can think of two. There was uh, Lazarus, and then there was a widow's son. And as they were carrying him out, he said, he's not dead, he's just asleep. Watch. Shake, shake, shake. And the guy jumps up out of that. Can you imagine little old ladies going, oh, and passing out? Huh? Yeah, that's right. He said, Talita Kumi, or damsel arise. Yeah, I remember that. So anyway, so we'll make it two and a half. Because she's only like 12 years old. Yes, Jaden. Three and a half. Who was the third one? Okay, let me see if I follow your answer right. Another little kid, whatever. Huh? Okay. Well, when you get it figured out, come see me, all right? But he raises a man that not only has been dead, but he's been dead four days. And I think that's where we left off in this story. So let's, um, let's pick it up in verse 17. Uh, when you get there, say amen. Amen. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I hope you have had a good day today. Uh, like I say, I'm a little achy tonight as some of you are. We've had nonstop rains coming in ever since Sunday. And um, this, this could turn out to be one of those flood years. Mississippi River is just over here about, what would you say that is? About three miles that way where that big bluff is. And... Um, so anyway, all the waters start backing up. Plus, we get in all the stuff. The, you get the snow runoff from Minnesota up north. Pastor Cooley, I woke up, um, what, what night was it? Sunday night or Monday night, or Monday morning early or something like that. And I knew we had storms coming. So I woke up when the storms hit. And then I'm listening to hail hit our RV, and I'm just going, uh-oh. Well, uh, Pastor Jason Cooley sent me a text. He said they had got hailstones yesterday. He sent me a picture. They were this big around. Golf ball size. That's literally golf ball size hail. And he said it beat his truck all to pieces. And I told him, I said, you need to check your house or have, it, have your insurance company come out and check your house. When, I, when we had hail several years ago, I knew it had banged up some of the siding so the adjuster came out and he said how's your roof i said i looked up there and it looks fine to me and he got up there went up there a minute and he said no 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 this roof is not okay you're getting a whole new roof out of this apparently it had just beat the roof all to pieces too but hail that size um the adjuster that came out to us and talked to us about our hail damage said he knew a guy that he insured a guy that had a real nice $100,000 sports car or something like that. He had just bought it, and it was sitting out in the driveway for everybody. You know, they're vain. They want everybody to see it. And it started hailing, and he went out there and literally laid across the hood of that car trying to protect it. And it put him in the hospital. It almost killed him. The hail was coming down so hard, and it was so big, it almost killed him. That, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So, and, and by the way, that's what you get for wasting $100,000 on a vehicle, okay? Just go buy you a putt-putt, get you a Flintstones car and go like that and take off. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Um, pray for one another. I'm trying to remember. Oh, before we pray. Jerica and what's the other one? Jillian, they turned 18 years old right now. So let's sing happy birthday to those two twins. And I still can't tell them apart. 
Happy birthday to you, oh happy birthday to you and you. May you and you find Jesus near every day of the year. Happy birthday to you and you, oh happy birthday to you and you. May the best year you and you have ever had had. All right, 18 years old. Now, Daddy, go buy him a car. And Daddy, uh, now it's time to start shooting boys. Amen? All right, let's go to prayer. Pray for one another. Uh, you pray for those that are sick. Uh, pray for us. Next Thursday, we'll be headed toward Fort Wayne, Indiana, Southwest Radio Conference. Pray for that. And just um, uh, tell God thank you for all that he's done in your life all that he's done through you to, for you to be a blessing to this church. I like you people. I really do. Because God uses each one of you in a way to be a blessing to this church. It's not just about me. It's how you guys are. And I commend you for that. Just tell him thank you for letting, you, letting him use you. And then pray for the needs of people and so on. We are going to do a feeding in Kenya this weekend for Easter. And... Um, so we've able to buy, there's mass shortages in Kenya. You can't hardly buy fuel, gasoline, things like that. You can't hardly buy it anymore. There's a lot of shortages now, and it's, you blame Russia. Blame Russia. But anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you, God, for the multitude of mercies that you have extended to every one of us. We thank you, Jesus, that you have prepared for us a haven of rest, that when this old ship of Zion comes sailing in, Lord, we'll be at home with you forever. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, all of our church members, and those, Lord, who could not make it tonight, those who are just not feeling well, those who are hurting. Bless our elderly people, Lord, and, and Lord, just watch over them this evening. I hope, Father, that while they're watching our service, Lord, that you would give them a blessing. And Lord, there's some hard things to be said tonight. I pray, dear God, that you would uh, help me to say them in love, things that I myself have been guilty of. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just help us to lay hold on the word of life tonight. And Father, we just uh, ask God that you, uh, at the end of this service, we have our prayer time, Lord, that you would hear us when we pray. And Lord, help us as we go about our week, keep us all safe. Bring us back to the next appointed time. And Lord, just again, just use us to do something for your kingdom's sake. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Again, the greatest, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest miracle that Jesus ever did in taking a man who had been four days uh, dead already, and you know what Mary and Martha said about him when Jesus asked them to remove the stone. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Look at John chapter 11, verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now, that four days, you could say that it's a type and a picture of how the world has been dead in trespasses and sins now up until the time of Christ for 4,000 years. A, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. So here they are now. They've been, they've been without the, the pure Lamb of God and they're dead in their sins for 4,000 years. Christ comes after 4,000 years from Adam. He comes after 400 years from the last prophet, which is Malachi, there's 400 years distance between when Malachi lived and when Matthew wrote, this is the book of the generations of Jesus Christ. 400 years passed. You think God doesn't count things? You think God doesn't do things in order? He does. And if you study this book and learn those numbers and learn the pictures behind them and the symbolism then God, I think, will help us see what really is the timing of the end. And let me just kind of unhook the train for a minute on this subject. I can remember preachers behind this pulpit, one in particular, his name was Frank Junta. 
he wasn't our pastor, but he was a, a home missionary. And he was here preaching a revival at our church. And um, don't ask me why I remembered this particular message, but he preached about the second coming. And he said, I absolutely believe that Jesus Christ will return in my lifetime. Now he died. He's gone on to be with the Lord. He's dead. Generations before him, especially during World War II, people saying, look, nation is rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. It's evolving the whole world. There's battlefields everywhere around the world. Surely this is a sign of the fulfillment of what Jesus said in Matthew 24. The Lord is about ready to step out and take control of this world and judge everybody. Well, that didn't happen. You go back into the 1800s, you had the cult leaders like Joe Smith and um, uh, Ellen White and, uh, let's see, uh, who's the, Charles Taze Russell, of the Jehovah's Witness. They all made predictions that they were living in the time when Christ was going to return and they did always did some sort of mathematics mumbo jumbo to prove that Christ would be coming on such and such day. And many of those people believed it. Some people even killed themselves when it didn't happen because they were afraid that they missed the Lord's coming and that they weren't good enough for that to happen. But they were following the words of a man or in, or in the case of Ellen White, they were following the words of Ellen White. And she's a Jezebel. She's, she's a false prophetess. She didn't know anything. She was wrong about most of her doctrine. So what I'm saying is, there's people, even back in the days of Paul and John, John being the oldest of the disciples, died in his mid-90s. And you remember what Jesus said to Peter. Uh, Peter, what if I have John tarry until I come? What is that to you? Because... Jesus had told Peter what was going to happen to him and what was going to befall him and what he was going to have to do. And Peter's getting a little bit jealous here. Okay, you got all this stuff for me, but what about John? How come he's not going to do anything? And Jesus said, what if he tarries until I come? Well, guess what? He did. John lived just long enough for Jesus to appear in his room with him while he's praying. So he came, didn't he? And he showed him the kingdom of God. And then when Jesus said, made this statement, uh, not all of you shall die before you see the kingdom of God. Well, John, in, by the mid-90s, is the only one left alive of the original 12. All the rest of them have died, and yet he does get to see the kingdom. Now, some people say that Jesus meant that the kingdom of God would be coming to this earth and taking place. That's not what he said. He said, they'll see the kingdom of God. And John did. He saw holy Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, coming down uh, from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And now God is literally dwelling amongst human beings. The God, God the Father, dwelling amongst... John got to see that, and then he died. That's how I want to go out, Amen. But anyway, um, well, that was really good. I was getting wound up on that. Forgot where I was going. But anyway, what I'm saying to you is a lot of people all throughout their generations have supposed that Jesus is coming back possibly in their lifetime. Now, I personally believe that. I believe in my lifetime, Jesus will return. I could be wrong. I could be dead wrong. So... Rather than just giving up and saying, I'm not going to worry about anything anymore. Jesus is going to be here before too long. What if that doesn't occur? Well, then I want to be busy doing the Lord's work until he does return. He tells us to wait on him and trust him. And Jesus made Mary and Martha wait on the Lord. And by the text, you can tell that they're a little bit upset with Jesus. Had you not come here sooner, Lazarus wouldn't have died. 
And I don't know about you, but I've been bitter at God a few times that way over different things. God, why did you let this happen? Why did so-and-so have to die? Why did all this bad stuff occur? Why did you let that happen? You could have stopped it. You could have intervened at any time and taken me out of it, but you didn't. But Jesus comes when Jesus is ready to come. And he came here after 4,000 years from Adam, after 400 days between the two covenants, four days after Lazarus dies. And it wouldn't surprise me if this was the fourth hour of the day. I don't know that, but it wouldn't surprise me. But God does everything in his perfect time. So, verse 18, Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. Somebody look up how long a furlong is. How long is a furlong? Do you know? Uh-oh. 200 and... So, 15... About an eighth of a mile? Okay, that's not long. I could run that. I'd collapse, but I could run an eighth of a mile. Verse 19, And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them, which con comfort them concerning their trouble. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And, and, and you can just sort of gain from that. I mean, how would you say it to Jesus? Knowing that Jesus could have healed Lazarus. But he didn't. Would you be a little let down? In your mourning him, would you be hurt? at Jesus because he didn't come earlier to stop Lazarus from dying and remember what I've always been telling you either God answers the prayer exactly the way you pray it or he does it better than the way you prayed it and in this case Jesus is going to answer their prayer better than they prayed it I'm going to go ahead and Jesus thinking to himself, I'm going to go ahead and let him die. And then I'm going to show them a greater miracle than they have ever seen before. Ever. And so she's a little hurt, a little upset. Had you been here four days ago, I mean, we sent word to you for you to get here in time. To heal my brother. Why did you wait? Why did you do this? Why did you let my brother die? She's holding back, I think. But it's in there. I believe that. And remember, this is a, an emotional woman who is grieving a loved one. Okay? And I'm not saying anything bad about women because men can do it too. You get a man or a woman emotional enough and they'll say what's on their mind. And they don't have the ability to hold it back. Um, yesterday, and I do this every now and then, I have days where, and yesterday was one of those days, I, wake, I woke up yesterday in a foul mood. Bitter. I was... I, I don't know what it was, I, but I was just very, very tormented within myself. And to those of you who are listening, if you called yesterday and one of the girls told you that I was not feeling well, that is true. The truth of it is, I did not want to talk to you simply because I was not in a talking mood. I was in a very sour mood and I had the ability to say things in the wrong way to people. I had that ability and I know better than to talk on the phone because if somebody would have called me and said, you know, pastor, I think you're wrong about something. That would not have been the thing to say to me yesterday. 
Okay, even though you can call me and tell me things like that on most days and I'll be fine with it. And I may I might even say, you know what, you're I'm reading scripture here. You're right. I was wrong about that. But just yesterday was not the day. Today was a little bit better. So this is Martha sort of giving Jesus a smack on the knuckles. Okay. And verse 22, she says, but I know. That even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. She's, she's emotional and she's angry at God, but she still trusts Him. You underline this in your Bible and write that down. In the little side notes there on the side, if you can, ha if you can write stuff down, write down, Martha, angry with God, but she's still trusting. She's still going to follow him. She's not going to turn her back on him. So verse 23, Jesus said unto her, thy brother, thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, duh. That, it loses something in the Hebrew or the Greek. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I'm the resurrection. You're looking, if, if you're looking for resurrection, you're, I am that. I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now what death is he referring to? Huh? The death of the soul in hell. Okay? When those who are judged are cast into the lake of fire, they are consciously aware of the torments that they are in. That was what we see with the rich man. And they are aware that they are being punished for their unbelief. Um, but Jesus said, if he, if you believe in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Even though his body has been put into the ground, he's not dead. The person that you really knew to be your brother or your mom and your dad or your grandma and grandpa or whatever, I, I fail not. Anytime I get a chance to go to our family cemetery in um, Arkansas and I stand there looking at the grave of my grandparents, my aunt, my cousin Debbie, we, we were real close, Melissa and I and my cousin Debbie, and then my dad, I, I cease not to break, I break down and cry every time. Because they're in the grave and that bothers me. So I would have said, I know they're going to rise again one of these days. And that's what I spake at my dad's graveside ceremony was. We're not burying this old man. We're planting a seed. God's going to raise up something better than what we put in there. Amen. So he says, uh, verse 26, and whosoever liveth and believes shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Is that not almost word for word what the thief on the cross has said? I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So she, even though her emotions, and let me tell you, you can't control your emotions the way people like Oprah Winfrey and all these positive speaker motivators and, and the Rick Warrens and the Joel Osteens and the Joyce Meyer crowd, they will tell you that not to have negative thoughts. Negative thoughts will kill your faith. And no wonder you're not getting your prayers answers because you're thinking negative thoughts. But the truth of it is, you don't always have control over your mind and what goes on up there. And that's why I did what I did yesterday. I just went and hid away from everybody. 
Don't talk to me. Don't try to provoke me into an argument because I'll slam the phone down on you. Done it before. And, and I don't like that. So I just avoid those things. So anyway, she believes. Now, in verse 28. When she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master has come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out and followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come down where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, unto, See, now, if Jesus is not God, as of this point right here in the gospel stories, both Jesus and Mary and whoever else bowed at Jesus' feet, all of them are guilty of blasphemy. Because not even the angels, the good angels, would allow men to worship them. And so, um, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. That sounds odd when we think about Christ being the almighty God. However, I love Jesus for this reason. That Jesus was, it didn't bother him to go down where the people were and to get his hands dirty laboring among them, working among them. Paul did the same thing. Paul had a trade, he was a tent maker, and he refused any of the money or a salary that whatever church he was preaching at, he would refuse it. And it, when he needed money, he'd go set him up a shop somewhere and make tents and sell them. And all the while, I guarantee you, he's talking the gospel to these people that are going by. Boy, what a ministry that is, amen? And I'll be honest with you. I, I, I see, and I was going to be this. I always had low expectations of myself. I couldn't wait. Get out of Bible college. Find me a good woman. And I said, boy, with my talents, I'd be able to get it about any church I want. I was so arrogant. And I said, boy, that'd be nice. I wouldn't have to go out and get my hands dirty doing some job. And you know what I hated the most in my teenage years, my early 20s? Do you know what occupation I despised the most? Construction. To me, construction was for a bunch of high school dropouts who did way too much partying, and all they were interested is earning beer money. And I had no respect for them whatsoever, and God said, <laughs> Where do you see what I'm going to do with you? That's what he said. But I like Jesus because he came down here and got his hands dirty with us. He knows what it's like to live like us. Okay? I'm not, I'm not in favor of anything that Anheuser-Busch has ever done, except own the Cardinals. <laughs> okay? But when Gussie Bush, the old man back in the 70s and 80s, when he died, he left his son, August Bush IV, in charge of the company, and August Bush IV ran the company, and then when August Bush the fourth, this was like in from the eighties into the nineties into the aughts, um, when August the fourth son got to the age he had already been through college, 
and everything like that. And he was trained in business and trained in marketing and so on and so on. But when he got out of college, his dad said, okay, I'm going to give you a job here. And your first job is you're going to work at the loading docks. Now, this is the king's son. Okay, this is this is his son. And he said, after that, I'm going to put you in the mail room. And after that, I might have you do some janitorial work. And I don't know what his son's response to that was. But if he said, Dad, what do I have to do all that stuff for? Dad would have said two things. Number one, son, because you need to learn how to do a day's work. Like everybody else that is here in this factory, you need to know what a day's work feels like. Number two, you're going to have to get to know these people whose families you're going to support. Very wise man. Very wise man. I'm sure his father did the same thing with him. So like I said, I don't care much for the Bush family. But that one thing, when I heard that, I said, that is, that is a very wise father. God sent his son down here to live as we live and to groan in his spirit and to not be at peace and not be at rest and to know what hunger is and to know what being thirsty is and knowing what pain feels like and knowing what it's like to lose friends and, and family. They, and when they die, he knows what that's like. Jesus standing up on the cross looking at, good grief, it's 8 o'clock already, looking at his mother Mary, her weeping at the foot of the cross, having compassion on her. What, what am I going to do about my mother? I care for her. John, will you take care of my mother? Mary, would you be the mother of John? And John said, yes, I'll do it. He cared because he came down here and lived what we go through. That's the kind of generals that armies will get in behind. Let me tell you another story. J.R., you don't like this one. This is a World War II story. General Eisenhower had a very... Um, unique ability to always go where his troops were and watch them train and visit with them and talk with them. There's, there's footage, and this was not staged because this is how Eisenhower was, that right before D-Day, um, Eisenhower is meeting with his soldiers, shaking their hands, he, was, he smoked at that time. He would light a cigarette, probably offer a cigarette to some of his guys. And you know what those guys did? They rallied around General Eisenhower and they said, we're going to win this for you, sir. We're not going to fail you, sir. We're going to take that beach. We're going to take these towns that you want us to. And we're not going to stop until Adolf Hitler gets the biggest dose of America that any man can have. Meanwhile, Adolf Hitler, by that time, uh, he had his own personal doctor. And he did exactly what Prince did, what Michael Jackson did, what Elvis did. You know what all three of those men did? They hired their own personal doctor to wait on them hand and foot and to give them drugs that they were not probably supposed to have. Hitler was being given doses of cocaine every day. Elvis was getting all of the pain medication that he ever could take. Um, Prince died of a drug overdose from, if I remember right, from doctor prescribed drugs that made him high. Michael Jackson, how did he die? Wasn't it fentanyl? Propoval? He was getting injections of this narcotic pain medicine so that he wouldn't hurt, and he liked it. And the more 
he got, the more he wanted, and he basically demanded that doctor to give him what he wanted, and it killed him. He stopped breathing and killed him. Um, and what happened with Hitler was, early on, Hitler would always rally his troops. But because of the drugs and because he had already had uh, an attack against him within his own ranks, he was fearful of all of his generals. The, there is a story, and I've heard it from two different sources, that's a true story, that Hitler was riding on his train. He had his own train that carried him back and forth to places. And he's sitting there by the window eating his nice hot food in this very comfortable uh, uh, restaurant train thing that he's on. And a train passes him going in the opposite direction. And it's full of his German soldiers who had just come off the Russian front. They had bandages on. They were wore out. They had been freezing to death. Uh, hypothermia. Had, they, some of them lost parts of their feet, their hands. Those men were starving to death and weak. And what were they fighting for? Were they fighting for Germany? No, they were fighting for Hitler. And they were all, as they passed by, they would say, they're fewer, they're fewer, they're fewer. And Hitler reached over, took the shades and pulled it down so he wouldn't have to see that anymore. And it bothered him. You know, I don't want that bothering me while I'm eating my supper. And what I'm saying to you is tonight, we have a Savior, an advocate with Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have a high priest who has not been touched by our infirmities. He's gone through everything we've gone through. Now watch. Um, verse 34. And said, here's what Jesus said. Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the whole Bible. One of the most profound verses in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. Knowing that, knowing that he, in just five minutes, Lazarus was going to be alive. But the Bible talks about the sting of death. The sting of death, number one, is when it stings us and we die. The, the only thing I fear in dying is, is this going to hurt? Right? So... When Al Hempfield's mom passed away here a couple of weeks ago, she died in her sleep. That's how I want to go. I don't have to feel anything, don't have to be afraid of anything, nothing. Just die in my sleep. But Jesus now knowing, and the, here's what I'm trying to say, the sting of death also applies to those who are left behind looking down in the casket. I've been with all the families. Usually have, at first, they have a family visitation. And then an hour later, they let the general public in. Generally, I'm there with the family during their visitation. And I've watched those people walk down that aisle. And come down and look inside that casket of somebody that they loved with all their heart. Crying hurting, weeping, not able to shut it off, not able to put up a smiling face. And Jesus did the same thing. He this was not a show that he put on. As a human, Jesus was stung by the sting of death. In this case, the death of Lazarus. For he loved Lazarus but Lazarus died and now Jesus is no different than any one of us who stood and looked in the casket of somebody we dearly love amen that's why I love him because you know I told you the story when our granddaughter died All I, all I could do, all I wanted to do, I knew I had so much bitterness in me. And I just called my wife and I said, I'm coming home. She said, why so early? I said, I'm going to go cut a tree down. 
And she didn't even question. What? And I went in, found it. I didn't get a chainsaw. I went and got an axe because I wanted to beat that tree. I wanted that to come out of me. And it did. And me and God had a conversation right then and there. God knew what I was going through and what I was feeling. He knew it because he experienced it. Now, I know that my granddaughter will rise in the last day. She's going to see Jesus before I do. And I'm okay with that. But Jesus wept. And he, I would say, that he weeps for all of those whom he loves. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, uh, I'm going to read a couple more verses and I'm going to end it with something for you to think about. In verse 36, then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave. And a stone lay upon it. Okay? Now I want you to think of the symbolism of a stone. The symbolism of a stone. Okay? Remember when the five Philistine lords were captured by Joshua's men? And they took them and put them in a cave? And then what'd they do? It was more than one stone, but they just piled the biggest rocks they could carry. They piled them up to seal off that cave. Caves, even in the occult world, caves have always been seen as a portal to the underworld. A lot. Manly Hall says a lot of rituals have over the years been held in caves. Why? Because they represent the heart of the earth where all the foul, evil spirits are. And their chants and their incantations, I believe, are meant in some way to release those spirits out of that cave. So it's a place of curse. It's a place of death. It represents the gateway to hell. So now what is that stone? What did I just say? What are the words I just said? Huh? Gateway. Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then neat? That stone was the gate to hell. And it could not hold Lazarus in. Amen. Now, one more. And then you think about this. You got a week. Verse 39, Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Now, Jesus is, he can do things. Jesus can defy the laws of, gravics, of physics. Gravics and gravity and physics was what I'm trying to say. So, gravics. Jesus can defy the laws of physics. He can walk on water. Okay? Couldn't he have moved the stone by just going? Sure. But he didn't put that stone there. His friends and family did. And there's a great lesson to be learned in this. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shalt, shouldest see the glory of God. And Jesus was right. And since Jesus wasn't the one who rolled that stone in its place, he was not going to be the one to remove that stone. 
He was asking the people who put it there to begin with, you take away the stone. Now I want you to study stones in the Bible. Stones and rocks, okay? A lot of good verses. Jesus is the, say the word stone. Jesus is the, that the builders rejected okay and I and I want to tell you too much about I want you to study this and next Wednesday night I might ask you what what do you think that this stone could and there could be multiple answers so don't think well that's probably not what Mike's thinking so if you come up with something good say it okay do your homework study stones and rocks in the Bible and I'm gonna, I might ask you, does anybody have an idea of what that stone represented? Or one of the things that it represented? And why Jesus commanded them to take it away and he didn't do it himself. Okay? So that's next Wednesday night. The Lord willing and the creek don't rise.